From the Microsoft Technology Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota, this is Tech Connection Live. Brought to you by Component One Ultimate. Download your free trial at componentone.com slash ultimate. Up next, Branches and Merges Are Bears, Oh My, by Craig Bernson, Microsoft MVP and Chief Software Gardener at Mojo Software Works. Who is doing version control or source control in their work? I was hoping every hand, okay. Subversion? TFS? Git? Visual Source Safe. Who's using Visual Source Safe but afraid to admit it? Okay. Um, we're going to talk about some good version control practices today that really are applicable to whatever you're using, whatever your environment may be, whether you are in a large corporation, a one-man shop, a small shop. Ideas to keep in mind to help you with your version control and make that easier. We're also going to talk about ways to avoid branching. Merging is the, really the problem with, with what you're doing with version control. And one way to, to make merging easier is to not branch in the first place. So we'll give you some ideas on how you can avoid branching. And we'll talk about good branching. There's times when you have to branch that it makes sense. And we'll give you some ideas on how to go about that. And then give you some best practices to keep in mind as we go along. So the first question is, who calls it version control and who calls it source control? So version control, source control. Okay, I tend to call it version control because everything should go in there. If you have Word documents as part of your requirements, those should go in there. If you have Visio drawings, those should go in there. If you're doing UML diagrams, those should go in there. And it's not really part of your source, source for your application, but it's part of what you need going forward. So I will generally call this version control, although sometimes I'll slip and call it source control. All right. So there's several generations that source control has gone through over the years. The first, no networking at all. You worked with one file at a time. You typically locked that file so no one else could get to it. Um, there are a couple of products back in this time. This is back in 19, about 1972, um, RCS and SCCS. And SCCS was developed by Bell Labs. It's generally considered the first version control application out there. Then we can add a second generation of version control systems. This was centralized. This is things like TFS, Virtual Source Safe, even Subversion. CVS might have been used by a lot of other people. Um, you, you could go with multiple files. And typically what you do is is you bring down the latest updates and try to merge those and then you'd commit your updates back into the system. And right now we're kind of in our third generation of source control. This is distributed source control, so products like Git and Mercurial are big in this, in this area. Um, and you work in what's called change sets. And typically you commit back to your, your source control before you merge. And so the way this works is each developer actually has a full copy of the repository on their local drive. And they work and they commit to that. They keep committing, committing, committing. And when they're done, they push that out to the centralized server so that everybody else can get those commits. And it does a fairly good job of handling merges just automatically for you, but it doesn't do everything. And you can still have problems. So we've talked a little bit about centralized. The different types, uh, subversion, TFS examples, uh, distributed with Git. And then there's a third type of version control systems called stream-based. A couple of these products are AccuRef and ClearCase. And what they do is when you, when you commit back, it tries to do a merge, and it looks at all the different branches you have, and it tries to find the uh, common parent of all those branches. And what it does is it tends to merge back into that common parent so that all these branches, it can merge back into all of those going forward. They don't get a lot of, of use. You may not have ever heard of them. Um, and then there's another one called Telelogic that's kind of along the lines. It's from IBM. It kind of straddles the centralized distributed theme a little bit. Because there's a lot of different ways that, that companies are trying to solve some of these problems. But in the end, you still have issues. And there's also basic goals between all of these. You work simultaneously, that each, each developer can work at the same time and maybe even on the same files. 
You don't want your changes to conflict with others. And you should archive every version of everything. Push everything in there. There's no reason not to. Now, if it's a binary file, such as uh, maybe some UML document or, or something like that, um, you might have issues because it's hard to version those or, or merge those back in. But some of these products try to do some of that. Subversion is one. So there's some other areas that this touches on. It's called continuous delivery. Continuous delivery is a process where you automate as much as of your, your development as you can to push it out to your user. Continuous integration is the first step of this in that you check in your code and then it's brought back out and automatically built on a build server and then tested and then pushed out to some acceptance testing and you automate that as much as possible. You might do capacity testing, you might test manually, you might automate your deployment. And this is con considered now a best practice in software development is to automate as much of this as possible. And the key to making this work is to check in to your version control system often. In fact, if you're doing a good test-driven development, you're checking in multiple times a day so that this can get done properly and this whole process is, is streamlined. The other idea here is that every build is potentially a release candidate. So every time you check in, that potentially could be released back to your end user, which means you don't want to break the build. That's a bad thing. The other key here is that branching is an anti-pattern because what happens is you branch and then you tend to set up a continuous delivery system for that branch. And that's actually an anti-pattern. You don't want to do that. You always want to be working on the trunk if possible. And if you're doing lean development, branching is a waste because that's things that are not in production yet. And anything in lean that's not in production is considered waste. So why do we care about this? Well, first of all, version control is central to this deployment pipeline. If you don't have good version control, none of this other stuff is going to work because it's at the far left end of that graph we just saw. And poor version control is a barrier to our fast, low-risk releases. That's the whole idea of this deployment pipeline is to push things out faster and lower risk. That's why you automate as much as this as you can because manual processes tend to break down a lot. You skip a step. Why do you think pilots have a checklist that's written that they have to go through? Do you think they skip things now and then? Possibly. We hope not. But it's, it's very easy to miss things. So how often are you going to release then? Depends on the type of, of software you're developing. Right? This is kind of a typical release schedule you might see. Right? When I worked at 3M, uh, I worked in a very tiny division that was actually an independent software vendor. We created software for the hospital industry. And so we had uh, updates of the software, believe it or not, quarterly even though this was pushed out because we were mandated by law to have certain updates pushed out quarterly. So we had quarter releases. That's a pretty tough thing to do in that environment, but, but we managed it. Now I work in a corporate environment, corporate IT, and we just push out whenever we have updates, whenever we need things pushed out. But this is somewhat typical of what you're going to see out there. So do you think that it would be any different as far as how do you manage your merging and your branching based on what your release schedule is? It's not. You're still going to have to branch. You're still going to have to merge. You're still going to have to try to avoid branching and merging. And it's pretty much the same concepts no matter when you're going to release and what the type of environment you're in. So there's a number of reasons why you're going to branch. First of all, it's physical. The way your files are actually stored on disk. What components are you integrating into that application? What subsystems do you have to rely on? You may branch based on those concepts. It may be functional reasons. It may be logic changes in your code. It might be having to release patches. It might be enhancements and different reasons that you might have in there for functionally changing the software. It could be environmental. It could just be based on what compilers and windowing systems you're using what third-party libraries or even in-house developed libraries you're using, what hardware and, and operating systems are you working on. Windows 8, you're getting ready to ship, right? 
Are you going to have to support Windows 8 in your environment, and will you branch to test that and see how that works properly? Maybe. Depends on what your software is doing and what you're relying on. But these could be reasons for that. It could be the way your company's organized. What types of activities and teams do you have? What's the roles that you're dealing with? What other sub-projects are going on that influence the application you're working on? It could just be procedural. What policies are in place where you're at? What, uh, what process do you have? What's the behavior of your team? I worked on a team once, and they were constantly branching. Oh, we'll just create a new branch all the time. And it created issues. So why is merging bad? Well, first of all, typically, it's poorly planned. You don't think about what's the implications of branching and when you have to merge this back in again. Typically, branches are too large. You're trying to break off too much of the functionality and the application and bring it in at one time. So that doesn't work well, because that means merging is much more complicated. You have to deal with more things. The other issue that happens is that teams typically merge far too late in the process. The development manager comes running in. We have to ship tomorrow. It's time to merge. I'm sorry, you're not going to make it. Why? Because you can't thoroughly test that. In fact, you probably can't even merge efficiently in that short of a time frame. So what this happens is that your application takes longer than expected. Those last minute delays come in play. That's when your CIO comes running down. It's mad as everything because you can't get this release out in time. You have fewer features. Oh, we can't merge this stuff back in time. We'll just drop this feature out of the product. And you're lower quality. You can't possibly test everything sufficiently to make sure it's all working in the time frame that you're given based on when you're merging too late. So let's look at an example of what happens in a typical environment with branching. So here's our trunk. This is our mainline development. Right? So we're working on this product, and we make a release. All is good. Yay, we shipped. Right? Shipping is a feature, by the way. And so now it's time to start working on the next version of the product. And you decide what you're going to do is try to put some performance enhancements into the product. So your branch. So here's your branch to do performance enhancements. Oh, you've also got to put in some new features. Because customers won't buy your product if all you have is performance enhancements. You've got to have some new features for them. And then you find a bug in what you just released, and you have to ship a patch. So you do another release. Guess what that means? You ought to take those changes and merge those into those two branches, because that code has to be in place there. Oh, wait, we have another feature we've got to throw in there. So you branch again. And then you have some customer that comes along that says, you know what? I like what you're going to be doing in this branch down here, and then I'm going to want some other functionality. So you create a brand new trunk just for this customer because you you're like, we're never going to merge this back in again. And this is just going to be custom work for this one customer. So now you've branched again. And then you decide to take some of these performance enhancements and merge those back into the trunk because those are working great. You know there's still some more, but you want to get those back in again. Oh, yes, you've got to merge those into your other branches. And then you're, you're done with this branch of these new features. And you say, we're not going to release the product, but we're going to release this branch. But you have to merge that, of course, back into everything else, except for your performance enhancements, because you're really close to having those done. And then you release those performance enhancements. Those are ready to go. And oh, yeah, you've got to merge that into this customer's branch so that he gets all this performance improvement going on. And uh, then you release your other branch. Those features are done. And oh, yes, because he wanted those, you've got to merge all that stuff back into this customer's custom branch. And then your customer gets released. And all is happy, right? Not quite. You decide that all the stuff that customer wanted is really great stuff. 
And you want to make that available to all your other users, so you merge that back into your main trunk. And guess what? All that red is places in your code where your product is not releasable. If you had to go back and rebuild things, you can't release at any of these steps in the process. And guess what? This is a whole lot simpler than real world. So the question is, how do you deal with this? How do you not get into this mess? Two ways. First is avoid branching altogether, which you can do. And the second is do what's called good branching. Branch in smart ways. We're going to look at both of these. I'm going to start off with avoiding branching. And the key to this is develop on your trunk or your main line. And that sounds scary, because that trunk is supposed to stay releasable at all times. The key to this is continuous deployment that we talked about earlier. There's four main ways you can develop on the main line. Hide new functionality, do incremental changes, branch by abstraction, and use components. So let's look at each one of these in a little bit more detail. First is hide functionality. The way you do this is you put the new features in, but you make them inaccessible to the users. You've got to test these some way. So you turn it on and off through configuration. Planning and delivery become much easier because this stuff's already in your main line. You don't have these branches going on. And this works in the real world. Many years ago, I worked with a product called Fox Pro. Yeah, people have heard of this, right? When they put IntelliSense into Fox Pro, all the code was in the product, the version before it was actually made available to the users. They just didn't have it turned on. The reason? They didn't have enough testing resources to test it to make sure it worked right. But it was all there. But I couldn't make it work. This does work. Here's what, here's what this looks like. Here's your branching path. There is no branches, because everything's done on the main line. Simple? whole lot easier. There's no merging. OK, the next is incremental changes. And here's when you're going to do these. Uh, when making large changes, it's tempting to branch so that your developers work faster. Reality is, the bigger the apparent reason to branch, the more you shouldn't do it. That's, that's opposite of what you think logically. But that's what works in, in real life. We think, this is a huge reason to branch, so let's do it. So the way to do this is to break down your major changes into small parts and implement those small parts one at a time. Gee, that looks familiar, doesn't it? Because again, we're working on our main line or our trunk. There's no branching going on. Branch by abstraction. The idea here is you create an abstraction over the code that needs to be changed, or you wrap that in, in some way. You refactor that code, the code that it's calling, to use this abstraction, or this, this wrapper that's around it. Create the new implementation. Update the abstraction to use the new code. Then remove the old code. Notice it says remove the old code. It doesn't say comment it out and leave it in the source file. Remove the old code. Why do you remove it? First of all, it's not needed anymore. Second of all, people often comment it out because they say, we might have to go back and see this again. Or we might need this functionality again. Well, first of all, if you need to go back and see it, you can always get it back out of your version control repository. That's why it's there. And second of all, if you actually do need that code, you probably really don't, because by the time you will, your business needs have changed and the code doesn't work anyway. Then the last thing you do is you may want to remove that abstraction layer. Okay, everybody get an understanding of this abstraction layer? How that works? It's just, just some code that wraps it somewhere. It might be an interface. It might be some design pattern that you throw in there to do things. There's several design patterns that work in this abstraction layer. That's what that looks like. 
Again, very simple because we're working on our trunk. All right, the last thing is components. Component is a very overused term. And I threw this definition up there from the book, Continuous Deployment, so that we are all on the same definition of what we're going to call a component in this case. Reusable, replaceable, uh, with something else that implements the same API, independently deployable, encapsulates some coherent set of behaviors responsible to the system. The key here is independently deployable. Okay, when I worked at 3M, we relied on components from another team. That was critical to our application working. So how do you deal with that? Because they're working on a different release schedule than you are. They're adding new functionality all the time. And so how are you going to then deal with this new functionality going in? They actually are changing their interface and how we're calling that from time to time. So how do you deal with that? Do we branch every time we release comes out for their component? No, we don't want to. So we wrap things up. So we use component when part of the code base needs to be deployed separately. Or we're moving from a monolithic code base to a core and plugins. This is if you're taking some big long-term project that's been around for forever in your company. And forever, I mean like, you know, maybe last year. Or if you need to provide an interface to another system. How about if your compile and link cycle are too long? Anybody thinks it takes too long to compile and link? A friend of mine worked at WordPerfect years ago. Remember WordPerfect, those of us who've been around for a long time? He worked at WordPerfect years ago when Corel bought them. The first thing Corel did was bought new computers for all the developers because it took so long to compile and link that they take the code home at night and build it at home on their personal machines because it was faster to do it that way. Risk? Oh, yeah, that was a big risk. Big risk that their developers had to, first of all, take code home, and second, it took so long to, to do that. So if your compile and link time takes so long, you might want to use components and develop those on different schedules. And by a component, I mean like a DLL right, that you can just plug in. So when you put references, who's not a Visual Studio developer? OK, so when you add a reference, you add a reference to a DLL, not a project. Because right? when you add a reference to a project, it'll recompile it if it needs to. So you add a reference to a DLL. Or if it takes too long to open a project in the IDE. How many of us have these big projects in Visual Studio and we launch it and we go get coffee while it's loading our project? And if you have a bunch of add-on third-party components, that takes even longer. By the way, it's sped up in, in Dev 11. Yay. OK. Um, that might be a reason for components, because it doesn't have to load the code if it's just a DLL that it's referring to. Or you might have this big code base, and one team can't deal with it. You may work on big, large, large projects like size that you have to have multiple teams. I'll feel fortunate. OK, so that's why you might want to use components. But there are issues with using components. First of all, you get components everywhere. We have 500 DLLs we have to ship. It's not Windows. You don't need that many, probably. Beware of God components. These are components that do everything, or everything has to go back and go through this component. That's probably not a good thing, either. If you have teams responsible for individual components, Teams should be responsible for a piece of functionality, not an individual component. Now, it might be that that component is everything to do with that piece of functionality. So it might be your team was responsible for all customer management functionality in the application, not the customer component. Because what happens if you start spreading the functionality out is you actually end up needing a component from that team over there who's doing something else, and you can't get stuff from them, so it stops you. You also have increased dependency management. It isn't just simple, 
click build in Visual Studio and produce every, everything in this one bin file or bin folder so that you can ship it all. You've got to pull all these other things in. That's another place that continuous deployment comes in handy because you automate the deployment. So it knows how to pull all these pieces together and where to go get them when you go to create your deployment package. So what do we think this is going to look like now in our, in our branch graph? If you says it's just one green line, you're close. This is each component, right? Each component has its own trunk, and it ships on its own schedule. So this is each team working on these pieces of functionality. And then you take that DLL and you plug it in. Because you're not dealing with source code, you don't need to branch. And if you're doing proper testing, you don't need to branch. Questions on developing on the main line? Oh, that's scary, because that means either I explained everything well, or you're so confused you don't know what to ask questions about. Yes, thank you. You saved me. <laughs> I feel like I could probably make that work if it were just me, but I've got to change the mind of all my developers that are working with me, and that's rather the point, right? Yeah. So um, I feel like I'm cramping their style if they don't get to work in their own branch and they don't get to go nuts for a day or two and then remerge. Okay, so let me, let me probe that a little bit and get some information about your environment. What's your source control system? TFS. TFS. Okay, so are you doing unit testing? Yes. Okay, and are you doing any other automated testing after that? What yes. Happens? Yes, you are doing automated testing. Okay, you're using the, the test stuff with TFS or something else? Yes, okay. the Visual Studio tools. Visual Studio tools, okay. So um, using TFS 2010? Yes. Okay, so you can shelf that, right? Okay, so what you have to do is change the way you're doing things. So ideally, they should be checking in multiple times a day, or at least once a day minimum, and it should shelf that until it passes the tests, and then it can't check it in. Are you doing that? Uh, gated check-ins? Gated no. check-ins. Okay, that solves that problem a lot. Okay, everybody understand how this works? Okay, we'll come back, we'll explain it in a moment. Go ahead. I guess my, my problem is not the technical one. My problem would be they like working in their own branch. They like just going to town. I would make them change. I would be forcing a new way of doing things on them when they just want to code and be productive. Oh, environmental and political issues are always the worst. <laughs> okay, so how, how often then are they merging? Uh, Every few weeks. Okay. And how often do you release? Every few weeks. Okay. So when they get done, you release. I mean, we already do work oh, in the oh. same branch as much as possible. Okay. But we do branch here and there for needs. And it's like, oh, I'm going to create a new branch because I don't know if this is going to work and I want to check in. And, you know, yeah, you could, I think you make good arguments that that's not necessary and let's, let's figure out a better way to do it. But I don't want to spend time figuring out a better way to do it. I just want to let them code. <laughs> I, right, got it, uh, and that's, that's an important thing. Um, we might come up with some ideas before we get done. Um, there are times that branching makes sense, and the issue is, is the other thing is, is these concepts don't solve every problem either, so it, it may not solve the problem in your environment. And like I said, environmental and political issues inside a company are far more complex than branching and merging. So that might be another issue going on inside your company. Um, so you're already doing some continuous integration. You're doing some of the good stuff along the way. Um, maybe you need to break that down into tasks. Are you using all the tasks in, in Visual Studio and signing throughout tasks and how they do those? So maybe you need to break down the task a little bit smaller and say when you finish the task check-in. I mean, I'm just throwing out ideas. So what happens in Visual Studio is you can do what's called a gated check-in. And so when they check back into TFS, it, if you're enforcing gated check-ins, it won't actually check it in. 
what it does is it does a, a, what's called a private build, so it kind of builds it on the side and runs the unit tests. And if it doesn't pass unit tests, it won't check it in. Because that way you don't pollute the, the main branch with bad code. There's other products that let you do similar type things, but we're talking about TFS right now, so it's a good way of doing it. All right, so this summarizes the develop on the main line. Any other questions on developing a main line? I don't know if I answered your question, though. For you. You've started to, yeah, I think we'll get more into it. Okay, if, if not, bring it up again. We'll see if we can, we can come up with some ideas. Okay, so when's branching okay? Okay, we talked about not branching at all, but there's times you need to branch. When you want to release a new version of your application, maybe you should branch because heaven knows that you release version 1.2 and you find a bug that's in 1.2 and you need to do a patch and go in 1.21 or whatever it might be. Right? When you want to spike out a new feature or you need to do some major refactoring. By the way, refactoring is not rewrite. Or if you have a short-lived branch that you make large changes that can't be done with other methods. The key there is short-lived. You want these as short as possible. I'm just going to pull a number out of the air and say a week. Three ways of doing this primarily. Branch for release, branch by feature, branch by team. So let's look at each one of these. Branch for release. You do all the develop on the mainline stuff like we've already talked about. When your code is feature complete and you say this is done, it's ready for release, whatever that might mean. That might mean release to the customer. It might mean release to your QA people. Whatever that means in your environment, you branch when your code is, is ready to go. If you find a defect, critical defects are committed on branches and then merged immediately back into the mainline code. The key there is merge immediately. Don't wait until you're ready to ship that next version of the product. You tag the branch when it's released and you don't create another branch until after that release. So you have fewer branches going on. I mean I've seen graphs where they have this branch come down and then a branch after that and a branch after that and a branch and you know it's this branch upon branch upon branch and it's way complex. So here's what this looks like. All right? We create a release Right, we release it, we find a bug, we fix that, we merge that back in. Right, notice that we don't do a release until that one's done, another branch, rather. So there's another branch coming off for that next release. Oh, the first one found a bug, we merge that back in the main branch and then down into that second release because it's affected by that bug too. It's really what we've seen because we're developing right on the main line. The other thing to notice is that those two branches have an endpoint. At some point you say, we're going to stop supporting this release. They don't go on infinitely. Branch by feature. A feature is how the user uses the product, how they see it being used. Think about an ATM, something we're all familiar with. Right? As a user, what does that look like? Okay, here's the way it works for me. I walk up to an ATM, I put in my card, I put in my PIN, I say withdraw money, and it says, sorry, you don't have enough funds. <laughs> yeah, right, okay. Hopefully, then it's, you know, you wait, you like that little sound, right? As it, as it gets your money, right? And you take the money, you take your card, you take your receipt. That's what it looks like to the user. That's a user story. Each user story is a branch. What the user does to just inquire on their balance, that's a different user story. There's some similarities. Put in your card, put in your PIN. But it's still a user story. So a feature is how the user sees this, this application working. Each story is a branch. After the story passes QA, you merge that into the main line because then you know your code's right. Then every day, you should see if there's any mainline changes to merge into the branches. Oh, look, 
We have a branch for withdraw. It works. Let's merge that into the main line. Then we're going to take that and merge that into a balance inquiry. Hopefully, your branches live a few days. The number of branches equals the number of current stories. So hopefully, you don't have a lot of stories you're working on at a time, because then you have a lot more branches. Any refactorings you have to do are merged immediately, because that means the code all through the thing is becoming better and better and better. This is kind of what this looks like. We've got two user stories going on. We've got two features. The first one's finished. It gets merged into the main line and then merged into the second branch. That again gets merged back into the main line when it's done. Branch by team. You want to keep your trunk releasable. This helps to ensure that. You merge in the trunk when it's stable and then immediately into any other branches. It works best if your teams are small and independent. 3M, big teams probably, right? We had 12 developers on my team, in addition to QA people and business analysts, et cetera, et cetera. This is similar branch by feature, but you merge more often. However, the problem here is with continuous integration, because your unit of work is scoped to the branch, not a single change, which means that you probably have CI running on a branch, which is considered an anti-pattern. So keep that in mind if branch by team is what you want to do. So this is what that looks like. All right, so we've got these two teams going along, and we just merge more frequently than we, than we did by feature. The other thing to notice in all of this is that you never merge directly from one branch to another branch. You always merge into the main line, and then from there down into the branch. Because that keeps your mainline releasable and keeps the mainline code the final source for everything. In fact, in all of these graphs, we've never seen branch merge from one branch to another. Branches should be short-lived. You should merge often and require good project management. All right, so any questions on good branching? Yes? You had mentioned uh, shelving earlier. Shelving, uh-huh. How does that fit into the picture? Um, it's, it's the same thing. When you shelf, it's going to run any unit tests on that code and make sure that they, they pass. And then it's going to check that back into the code. So in this case, you're going to say, I'm working on a branch. It's going to check it into that branch once the unit tests pass there. At, that point, at some point, you're going to say, it's time to merge that back in, what's in this branch. So the CI happens on the shelf. The CI happens, well, the CI happens on the branch. And so when, what happens is when you check in, you check into a branch, you don't check into the, to the main line. And so it's going to then run your CI. You've had to set CI up on that branch, and it's going to run those unit tests. And it says, OK, that works fine. And it's just then checking into that branch. And at some point, you're going to say, it's time to merge. So where was the shelf in this process? The shelf is when you try to check in, right? All you do is you say commit. And it knows it's supposed to go to the branch because that's where you've checked it out from. And so it goes to check it in and says, oh, I can't check in until it passes this. So it's going to shelf that for you automatically. So it's automated. Shelf. It can be. You can, you can purposely say, I'm going to check this into my own shelf. You know, I'm working on this this feature, and I need to go home, but it's not done. If I check it in, it's going to break that build. So you shelf it, because that way it gets your code on the server. Right? So it's more for disaster recovery in the event your hard drive goes down overnight. That's what the shelving is for. Shelving and gated check-in are kind of used as synonyms. They're not quite the same thing. But they're oftentimes used synonymously. Yes? At what point along the trunk uh -huh. do you change the version numbers? In other uh, words, you're releasing this constantly, you're saying, or it's releasable. Right. Using CI, the version number is going to change every time it does a build. Right. I get a build number, but sometimes I want to call my version from version 3 to version 4, four okay. features or whatever. Right. 
Um, so whenever you say we're done, we're going to release to the customer, then you're going to change a version number. So you're going to do a number of things. You're going to branch that for the version. And then you're going to change the version number on the trunk so it knows the next thing's going to have a new version number. In your version up there, you've got version 3, 4, and 5. Okay. I mean, let's, let's I'm a little concerned about what the version. Let's come back here for a minute to this one. Okay, branch for release. Because I think that helps explain it. So let me get my mouse over there so I can point. All right, so what happens here is you come along, you do a release. This is version one along this branch, right? So you're going to tag right here and say, now we're at version one, you're going to change the version one right there. So it knows everything along this line now is a version number one. One, 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 one. Oh, okay, we're going to do another release. So this now is branch version two, and you're going to stick version two in here. Right, so now this is being worked on version two, and of course now you're going to say we've got version three. So these people are now working on version three because you're working on the main line. So then over, I don't know, did that answer the question? I guess it's no simple answer. Perhaps it might work also to say how this would fit into the Microsoft versioning scheme. So when you publish your software, you've got your major version and your minor version. Because I think the question that's being asked relates to how do you distinguish an individual build from the rest of the builds that, that might be available to run since you're continuously releasing your product. Um, you tag it for one thing. And you, so you branch. So this is, this, we branch for this version. And this version's always going to live on this branch. So this is version one down here, right? And actually so here's- From a source standpoint, how about from your deliverable standpoint? How do you identify the deliverable with, with the source uh, branch? Ha, oh, this is the deliverable down here. So we're going to ship off the branch. And actually, if you're doing, I'm going to throw a new, another best practice for you. Don't just build in Visual Studio and release from there. Okay, Create your own build. And actually, as you do in your CI, you can create custom uh, project files that are build files. And it can go back in and change the version number on what it's creating. And it should be doing that. You shouldn't rely on Visual Studio to, to manage your version numbers for you. But I don't think that answers your question yet. That's, that's, you're correct. <laughs> All right, here's how I would do it. All right? This is version 1 coming down here. OK? At this point, this now, the trunk gets version 2. Yes. So the things that you're de delivering are either desktop software, web software, or something else. So if someone, if your user is looking at the software, how would they distinguish a particular build? If they're reporting back, let's say a bug, or if they want a feature off of a certain build, the way a feature is defined in that build, how would they know to tell you relative to what build they're talking about? Um, the DLLs and the executables get the build number built put into it. So if you right click on a file, you can look at the version number from that. Or you might have some feature in your application to reveal, you know, a help about type thing. So I think the question that was being asked earlier was talking about how do these build numbers get generated relative. You've got version, you've been talking version one, two. I think you've got build, build number as a separate paragraph. Build number is a separate piece. It's in four pieces. And your CI system should increment the build number automatically. And you might be skipping build numbers. You might have some that never ship because it's just building. It just sits on the server. OK. So just let it increment that. Just let it increment the build number. And then you control the version number through your external build files and inject a version number at build time that you want to, it to be called. So what you're going to do here is, you're building all the way up to here, and now you release this, right? And this is version 1. And there's a build.proj file. Typically, it's called build.proj. And it has all the instructions for MS build on how to control that. And in there, it says, every time you build, take this version number that we're going to call it, whatever it might be, 
and in, in that build num in the build file it says 1.0 point and then you put a parameter in there so it changes the build number for you right and it's going to actually inter inject that into each file so they each get their own build number and their own version number then you come up here and you create a new build file or you modify the master build file for build version 2 and these all build on version 2 and when you branch it branches that build.proj file off and now it's going to do its own thing and everything gets injected with version 2 it's a simple file, it's an XML file, it's very easy to, to manage yes Craig, what, what do you, when you say CA what are you talking about? CI continuous integration And I wrote a great book on it, <laughs> Continuous Integration in .NET from Manning, that tells you how to do all of that kind of stuff. It's not the only book out there, but you know I have to plug it. <laughs> I don't think I still don't think I answered your question. So maybe I'm not quite understanding what you're asking. You're talking to me. Yes. Yeah, it's. I, I see it as very difficult to, like what he said. You're gonna. I'm gonna release a product, but. You went down to that branch and you said that's version two. <clears throat> I'm not actually clear how it got from version one to version two just because it branched. You okay? All right. And, and I'm talking about what the customer sees. Okay, what the customer sees. Okay. So you're going down here. This is version one. We're okay there, right? All right. So when you get to version two, there's a file that sits as part of the project in source control called build.proj. This is, and then when you manage and run UMS build, you tell it to run it against the build.proj, not against the solution file. Right? So MS build runs against this build.proj file. And at that point in there, one of the instructions is go in and get this specific version number. And in there, it's hard coded as 2.0 point parameter. Right, the parameter is the build number. And it says take this and apply this version number to every file you create, every assembly, whether it's an executable or DLL, every assembly, apply this version number to that file. So it doesn't matter what the developers are developing on locally, that's what actually gets shipped out to the customer, is two point whatever. And, and as it builds, it puts that in that file automatically for you. Part of my confusion, I think, is I don't do what you're suggesting, but I don't. I have to manually do this. I'm a one-man shop. Okay. I do this myself. Okay. I don't have team foundation. So then, that. then you go into uh, the project properties. Okay, and you change the project properties for each one of your projects to say two point something, or you start doing. You can do CI very easily as a one-man shop. It's it's easy to do. So then, at each build, the uh, file will get rechecked in so that the build number will be uh, kept. Uh, well, what's going to happen is your developers all all, ch all check out from here, right? And they'll get this new file downloaded to their machine, the build up project. They, they won't touch that. You just say, you guys don't go in and modify that. We, you have somebody in charge of that file. Right? And so, locally, on their t on, when the developers compile locally, you don't care what build number that's getting locally. It has no, no implication on what happens. This is if you're with a team. It has no implication on what happens on the build server. So just to, to add for, for an idea for you, what we do where I work is we have a version.h file. And that version.h file gets a central place where all your DLLs and DXEs would, would pull that, this version number from. And then the build happens as well, and that gets put in. So, so in the resources, the uh, version number one would get pulled into the resources for that version. And so when you do your build, it automatically updates the version based on the version you placed in your version.h file. It's a similar concept to using the, the build.proj file. Is, is that like when you build like a one-click application? Well. When you build, if, you're, if you build locally in your machine, it's going to build the solution. If you just go into Visual Studio and click build, it right, builds against the solution file, not against the build.proj file. You actually have to, to do msbuild at your command line, say msbuild, and then the name of the project file. 
of your, your new build file, and it controls all that for you. So it's, it's a slightly different process than what you normally get. You can also put pre and post commands inside each project. So you can say before you build, do this, and after you build, do that. I don't like that because it kind of obfuscates a lot of stuff and things just kind of happen by magic. But you can also tell it to go in and change version numbers at that point too. It's, it's more complicated. I don't like that method. It's, it, I think it's easier just to say MS build and have it run against this new build podge file. So it's just, it's just for the project inside the solution? Well, it's, it's, a special it's a special project that's used just to build. Okay. It's a configuration file for the build process. When, when you click build in Visual Studio, what it actually does is it runs another program called MS Build, and it runs it behind the scenes. And all it does is it gives it, it sends it as a parameter your solution file. And so it just builds against that solution file, and in that solution file is every one of your projects that you have, and it just calls each one of those projects and builds it as it needs to. Right, so if you run, a, you can also say run it against a specific project file. And when you say run against that project file, it, it looks at this project file. It looks just like a .cs proj file. In fact, a .cs proj file is an MS build file. But all you're doing is you're putting specific commands in there to do things like change the version number, zip files afterwards, copy the assemblies to a certain location. You can put literally any command in there. You can say, go out and run this other executable as part of the build process. There's a whole slew of things you can do. I don't know if that answers, answers the question or not. But so sometimes yeah. it's called build.config too, right? It can be build.config. I think more commonly it's called build.proj. It's just another project file, just like any. A, a VB project file is just an XML file that tells MS build how to build that project. That's really all that's in there. It, it's, it can get very complicated, but that's really what it's doing. All right, so let's look at some other best practices. Compare before you commit. Don't commit because you might over, you know, step on somebody else's changes. You might have two developers actually were working in the same file. Read any merge comments from other devs when you check in. Make sure you put comments in there about what you changed so that you can find out what's changed in that commit. So see what other people are doing. Keep your repository small, especially if you're using Git because you keep a copy of it locally, the entire repository. Uh, group the commits logically. So if, you're, if you are committing, say, for a feature, here's everything I did today. Make sure they're logically organized. Okay. I'm working at, in a corporate IT shop, so I might say, I have to change for this bug, now this bug, now this bug. And oh look, now I have to change for some other application. I've got this bug, this new feature. Well, each bug should be a separate commit, because they're logically organized. I shouldn't do all those bugs at once and commit. I shouldn't say, I'm going to commit this whole thing for these two bugs and this new feature. It should be organized in a logical way. Explain commits. We've talked about the comments. Um, only store what's manually created. There's no reason to um, store anything that's generated. Why do you need to check in a DLL that you create as part of your build process? Because you can recreate that. Don't break the tree, so don't, don't break things when you check it in. Um, use tags, because tags tell you what things happened, what versions happened at what point in time. Review your merge. Um, don't obliterate, so just don't wipe things out and have no reason for not com comment, no comments of what you did. Don't come out a code and then check it in. Don't lock a file because that means somebody else can't get to it and they may need to get into it. Build and test everything. If you're not doing your local, if you don't pass your unit test locally, don't commit. Because that means you're going to break the build for somebody else. And I know at Microsoft, if you break the build, they'll call you in whenever it, that 
they find out. If it's 4 in the morning, you're going into work at 4 in the morning to fix it. Okay, a couple of good references. A book called Continuous Delivery. Um, this is by Jez Humble and David Farley. They have two, about, well, about one and a half chapters they spend just on source control processes and techniques and how to branch and when. But also explains that whole de deployment pipeline process. And another book called Version Control by Example by a guy named Eric Sink. That's actually a free book. Um, and it, it takes multiple version control systems and walks through the same process in each. You know, Sally is working on a code, and now Joe gets the same code and has to work on it. And what happens in their process? And he goes through that same process for multiple products, including his own. But he goes through some of, uh, several of them. So there's some good references. So let's review. We talked about version control in general. A lot of the stuff that's happened behind the scenes, a little bit of the history. We talked about how to avoid branching, hide functionality, do incremental changes, branch by abstraction, use components. Those all help you avoid branching in the first place. If you can avoid the branching, you never have to merge. Good branching. When is it a good idea to branch? How does that help you merge? If you're branching in a smart ways, the merge becomes much easier. A couple of the keys is, first of all, short-lived branches, very short-lived, and don't have a lot of branches going at once. That really helps. And don't branch off of a branch if you can help that. That gets way more complicated. Few best practices, and keep the trunk releasable. That's one of the keys to good deployment pipelines and good deployment practices. So any questions? Yes. So what we do is we is mostly close to your branch by team strategy. Okay. Uh, we started off doing the branch by story or branch by feature strategy, but that seems to fly in the face of your earlier one of don't branch if you don't need to, because so often we want to work on two, three, five, seven stories, and all the changes are relevant to the other changes, and so we end up just merging, 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 and mm -hmm. it would have been better off just to all work in one branch for for five or six stories. Okay. Do you see a problem with doing it that way? No. I mean, again, these solutions aren't applicable in every case. And what works on one team may not work for another. Again, because again, those political and environmental things really come into play. And you've got to work through those. Um, are you having merge problems? Yeah. I maybe don't want to bring up specifics okay. <laughs> to bog, bog it down, but sometimes we do, yeah. Okay. Um, sometimes you do. I think that's the best case scenario <laughs> in, in, in the real world. I mean, the whole idea here is how do you get a boy around always having merge problems? Because I know teams that always do that. Let's minimize that as much as possible because that keeps your code a lot better. Fewer bugs and more releasable. Okay, anything else? Yeah. You mentioned uh, not checking DLLs into the, into the source control. What's the best way to get those onto the build server when they're not part of your, you know? If they're from another team or third party, those you would check in. It's ones that you're creating as part of your build that you don't need to check in. And, I, and, and, and a good idea is, here's, here's how you think about this. You have a new team member come onto the team, and you need to get them the source for the application. They should be able to go to one place and get everything they need to build that project locally on their machine. Do one checkout and get it all. Good rule of thumb. So if it's, if it's third party, if you're using some of these great components from component one, check those in as part of your project. That might mean you might have them checked in multiple times for multiple projects, but that way you go to one place and you get everything you need. And that way it also solves problems of version management because you might have a project on version one and another project on version two of, these, their, of their comp third party components, right? And so you don't have to have, well, go to here to get the component one stuff and bring, oh crap, 
you need to do the version one stuff and version two is the new stuff. So if it's all checked in there, it solves a lot of that problem too. All right, thanks a lot. Tech Connection Live, brought to you by Component One Ultimate. Download your free trial at componentone.com slash ultimate. It's easy to build everything, everywhere, with the right tools and resources. Component One Ultimate delivers just that. Whether you're a Windows, Web, or XAML developer, the Component One Ultimate Collection enables you to create any type of application. WinForms, WPF, Silverlight, ASP.NET Web Forms, MVC, Metro, Windows Phone, iPhone, Compact Framework, and even ActiveX. This comprehensive package not only delivers hundreds of .NET controls, plus powerful OLAP data analysis controls, it even includes SharePoint web parts, documentation and screen capturing tools, light switch extensions, and tools for ADO.NET Entity Framework and RIA services. Plus, Esri mapping controls, the most comprehensive controls available for GI application development. Component One Ultimate, the ultimate collection of tools for software developers. Go to componentone.com to download your free trial of Component One Ultimate.